But let me turn it over to Nick and, and ask him to talk about his background and where, how he came to this. I think it'll give the right perspective. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Travis, for having us both here. And I think it's very important to, as, as Travis articulated in his introduction, to have a good faith conversation about this subject. Because wherever one stands on, on the topic of UFOs or UAP, as they're now called, yeah, and yeah. we can get into some, some interesting talk about the name change, wh wherever people stand, if, if you go on to social media in particular, and, and I think we've both experienced yeah. this, you'll see, and, and you could say this applies to a whole range of issues, but it certainly applies to this one, this massive polarization where you just get this, this skeptic versus believer split and this absolute chasm where there's no attempt to, to reach out the hand and, and shake the hand and have a dialogue. It's just either on the one side, uh, you're a complete fruitcake believing this, it's all just nut jobbery. And on the other side, you're an evil government debunker for suggesting. And, and that really doesn't help anyone because those sorts of people aren't suddenly going to change their minds. Mm -hmm. But there are, I think, people in the middle mm -hmm. on this issue, on a lot of issues, who would, I hope, benefit from a discussion like this. And now, just very briefly, um, my, my own background for those that don't know, I am not a scientist. I am a, a former UK government employee. I was a civilian employee of the UK Ministry of Defense, which is the equivalent of, of the DOD here. And I had a 21-year career there doing a lot of different jobs. And one of those jobs in the early 90s was I had responsibility for the UFO issue. I had to investigate the cases and assess whether or not there were any defense, national security, or safety of flight issues posed by this. And we, we essentially concluded that there were self-evidently because there were things in our airspace that we couldn't explain, and from time to time they did come dangerously close to both commercial and military aircraft, uh, to the point where literally people had to on occasion take evasive action. Now, our position, we tried not to be conclusion-led in any of this. So we didn't go in thinking it's extraterrestrial, neither did we go in thinking it can't be extraterrestrial. We, we just tried to say, well, what could it be? And, of course, going back through the archive of files, going back decades, because governments have been doing this for, for many, many years, most of the sightings fell into the following, I, I would say, four categories. Misidentifications, uh, deliberate fabrications like mm -hmm. hoaxes, psychological delusions... And, and, and this is more recent, perhaps, but sensor errors on, on a whole range of military systems. But, but we felt that there was something over and above that. And, you know, before I throw it back to Lawrence, I mean, I think one of the reasons we're here is that in the last six years, there has been a fringe to mainstream transition of this subject. One could say, I think, that it started on December 16th, 2017, when the New York Times broke actually two related stories um, and, and put them on the front page. The first was the existence of three US Navy videos of UAP, which are still characterized on the DOD website as being unidentified. And the second related was the existence of a Pentagon unit called ATIP, which stood for Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And, and of course, for years, the US government had said, we're no longer interested in UFOs, and nobody's been investigating this since the end of 1969, when the old US Air Force program, Project Blue Book, was closed down. Now, that turned out to be not correct. And what we've seen 
from then until now is, is more and more revelations and engagement on this. So after years of saying they're not interested uh, and, and they don't study it, NASA is now in the game and act actively looking at this. The Pentagon now has a unit called ARROW, which stands for All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. God, they love this word salad mm. stuff. Um, uh, Congress is engaged both in the Senate and the House, uh, the Armed Services Committees, the Intelligence Committees, the Oversight Committees, and there are multiple UAP provisions in the current defense bill and currently being debated and negotiated for next year's bill, so the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024. I'm not this evening going to tell you that aliens definitely exist, because I have no smoking gun. But what I want to put out there is the, the, the possibility, the two interrelated but separate questions. Is there life out there in the universe? I, I think a lot of, pr pretty much most people are coming around to the view that almost certainly yes. Mm -hmm. Are we being visited? That is a separate question for all sorts of scientific impediments to interstellar travel on a viable basis, which Lawrence knows far more about than I, and will expouse in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, but, but I want to say that even if something is not likely and has a low order of possibility, governments and the military and the intelligence community does take this sort of thing seriously. And we sometimes call it in government low probability, high impact scenario. E even if it has a comparatively small chance of being actually true, the societal implications, if any of this does turn out to be true, are such that we should be in the game and studying it. So I am very glad that we're having this discussion. I'm very glad that NASA, that the DOD, um, that Congress, are having these discussions, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and I hope more scientists and academics will come on board because, again, as Travis, I think, said in his intro, these questions are some of the biggest and profound questions that we can ask ourselves, and why wouldn't we want to try and get an answer? Okay, that's, that's a great sort of intro to... Uh, um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons that this, be, as you pointed out, has become so, such a great interest is because of the ridiculous... When the government is doing something and, and, they, and they don't say they're doing it, inevitably it gets discovered, and that gives the illusion that there's something to hide. Which is, so it's always much better to say... I think they were embarrassed about saying that they were actually considering this, and they figured it'd be better to say they weren't. And the concern of embarrassment over, overrode the the recognition that it, would, that it would inevitably come out, which is one of, uh, let me say, I have to say, when you're saying that Congress is investigating it, that did make me laugh, of course, because it's probably one of the, looking for UFOs is probably one of the more realistic things that the Republican Party is doing right now in this country. But um, the, the notion that one of, the, for me, besides the physics problems, and you're involved in the UK government, which tried to be transparent about this, I think, and, and transparently report what was, what was reported to them. Um, and, I've, and, I, and I think being transparent is very, very important. But uh, um, one of the things about it, besides the physics aspects, and we can get into why it's so unlikely that, that it's so difficult, if not impossible, to imagine people or beings coming here. Um, but for me, one of the biggest arguments against it is exactly this secrecy notion that somehow, and I've been to Roswell, and, I've been, I, and, and uh, I'll tell you that story sometime, but uh, the notion that the government could keep a secret of something of this immense potential significance effectively, to me, is much, more, much harder to believe than the physics aspects of, get, of, of, of getting here, especially when you consider that if anyone actually had real evidence, if any individual who was a party to that amazing conspiracy that some people think exists, it, it, there's so much money to be made in coming forward with that evidence 
that I find it absolutely impossible to imagine that that, that, that the government could keep a secret, as it obviously can't. It couldn't even keep a secret about the fact of whether they were investigating it. Uh, so I find that sort of sociological fact almost more difficult to believe, the, the conspiracy theory almost di more difficult to believe than the, than, than, the UF, than the alien theory. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, no, that's an interesting point. On, on secrecy, I would say this. Um, obviously, self-evidently, when we talk about this, we can only talk about secrets which have been disclosed, yeah. wh whether legally or, or through, through illegal leaks. Mm -hmm. But I know, as see, governments do successfully keep secrets all the time. And, and I mean, I know, thinking back historically, um, I've personally been involved with, with things way back then that have not leaked. And one could say that, um, you know, the, the likelihood of something leaking depends on a number of factors. It depends on, on the, the number of people uh, obviously working on it, but also the loyalty of those people, the, the um, penalties in terms of the criminal justice system that they would, would face if they leaked something illegally, and, and indeed the penalties in terms of national damage that would result. I mean, take, for example, historically, the people working on, on uh, the Manhattan Project. Um, no one would have wanted to have gone to the, the media and, and tell people about that. And I know that part of that was compartmentalized, but there were, there were plenty of people who, who knew what it was all about. And of course, for, for reasons of patriotism and, and such like, didn't say that. And, and the, the breaking of the German codes during the Second World War is another example of a, a secret that was kept for a long time. And people have this sort of false memory that that secret emerged in 1945 at the end of the war, and, and there was a sort of, ha-ha, we were reading your codes. A absolutely not true. It was um, late 60s, early 70s before that was disclosed. So, I mean, governments can keep secrets. And, and on, specifically on the UAP issue, if, if you go now to the Arrow website, which is aaro.mil, and, and see they are now, as a result of provisions in the 2023 defense bill, saying, because they are legally, congressionally mandated yeah. to, to report to Congress on any historical programs that do relate to technologies that might be extraterrestrial. They, they are saying, um, if you have information about these programs, please you know, contact us in confidence. But it's, it's a little bit of a mess, because at the moment, Arrow is investigating some of these claims. Congress is, both in the Senate and the House, and as I mentioned, in a range of those committees. Mm -hmm. and, and so is the Intelligence Community Inspector General, because there have been some whistleblower complaints. So it's a little bit of a mess, but literally this week, there have been negotiations in Congress on this issue. Yeah, the, 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 um, the it, it is interesting that, that I think that whether, how effectively secrets are kept are probably inversely proportional to the, to the um, payoff that someone who reports on them can get. National offense issues, strictly national offense issues, are the areas which are mostly kept secret. And, 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 um, but of course, the, the Manhattan Project was not only, you gotta remember, Roswell was 1947. So we all, we all saw Matt Oppenheimer. We all, <laughs> and, and, but well before that, in fact, well before the Manhattan Project was completed, the Russians already knew about it, okay? 